I was desperate, you know, at the time I was 17, 18, unemployed, you know, and I was desperate to, you know, to get a break. And I knew that if I did get a try, I would, you know, I would grab the chance. I think it was always going to be boxing. I mean, I stepped into the gym as a 10 or 11 year old. Boxing just took hold of my heart straight away. I love everything about the sport of boxing. Hello, I'm Marie Crow, and this is We Become Heroes, the Orshi sport podcast that explores how lead athletes and sports people reach the top of their game and the lessons that they learned along the way. Now, I am delighted to say that my guest today is one of Ireland's most capped footballers, Olivia O'Toole. Olivia, you're so very welcome. Thanks for coming on. And you're one of the people that I really wanted to interview because Anytime I interview any of the current players now or the players that maybe have just gone, when they talk about heroes and people that inspired them, your name is always top of the pile. How does that make you feel knowing that you inspired a generation of players? Yeah, good afternoon, Marie, in first place, and it's great to meet you. Um, I've just recently heard yesterday with Arnold Garman saying in our Sky interview, she was like, uh, I was one of our four girls that she ever seen playing in a women's game. And to hear that from Anya, which to me, she's an absolute legend, is it's, it's, it is inspiring. And I've heard it from a few of the girls. So obviously when I was playing, these were looking up to me and I didn't know. You know, so like to hear them now, when they're getting interviewed and all and saying, Olivia inspired me and she put her arm around me, made sure I was all right. It's great, it's brilliant to hear. It really, yeah, like, because, you know, often when people say, like, never meet your heroes or, you know, you know, the, your hero ends up being not the person that you thought they were going to be. But mm -hmm. like, when it comes to you, Olivia, like, it's still years on and they're talking about the effect that you had on them. So when you had the, the girls coming into the team, you must have just really made an impact on them, not just by what you were doing on the pitch, but what was happening off it as well, like just being there for them. Well, that's why... Well, as you know, when you're a senior player on a, an Irish team, a club, even a club, and you have a captain, and you have to make sure these 16 and 17 year olds that's coming in is okay. And you have to put your arm around them and make sure they're okay. And, and you know, because they're only kids coming in. You know, when on you come on the scene, on you was only 16, Emma Bourne was only 15, Neve Fatty, she was only 17. And probably me just being in the room and asking them, are they okay? That's probably, you know, good, great for them. But to me, that's just a natural thing to do for me. Do you know? So to hear them say, like, I'm an inspiration is, it's brilliant to hear, but it's, it's also, I didn't think I had that impact on them. Do you know what I mean? So from that prospect, it's brilliant, like, to hear. Yeah, it's really mm -hmm. lovely. And it's great to see now, like even from your point of view, to see the Ireland women's team doing so well. And, and look, on the pitch stuff is really important too, but the off the stuff pitch is also worth highlighting too, because, you know, we saw the struggles that they had with the FAI a few years back and the fact that they had to take that stand. They have now achieved a, a equal pay between the men's and the women's team. We're seeing their games on the television all the time. They've got Sky sponsoring them. They're just doing so well in all aspects. If we could just get to a major tournament now, you know, all the boxes would be ticked. But the progress to see it, Olivia, must be pretty phenomenal. Yeah, but the icing on the cake would be, after all, this is what they've gone through in the last two years, the icing on the cake would be to get to a proper tournament, the World Cup by Europeans. But... The way the game is going now is phenomenal. Like, I mean, any 15-year-old, 16-year-old coming into the game now, they need to inspire to be like Katie, to be like Megan, to be like Jess Sue, you know, because not only that there's money in it, it's a sport that people, girls love, and they leave it because there's no professionalism. But now with the Sky Deal and the girls getting sponsored and the equal pay is the main thing because of... What happened two, five, four or five years ago, the tracksuit situation. I mean, I play for Ireland. I won't go into what we had to pour up. But I want to glorify the FAI now because they're pushing the girls' team. Do you know what I mean? Which it should have been done a long time ago, but it's happening now. And it's absolutely phenomenal that the likes of Katie's getting sponsored. You know, girls are getting individually sponsored, not only by Sky, like that promoting the game, the um, role models for girls growing up now, you know, so 
that's the difference. And when I was playing, there was none of that. Mm-hmm. But where now the girls are nearly on the telly 24 7. You can go and watch a game if you don't, if you can't make it, you can watch it on the telly. You can watch it, you know, where years ago you couldn't watch it anywhere, you'd hear it on the radio. Yeah. So to see these girls, me personally, I'm seeing them every single day on the, the as you know, the Twitter, the Facebook, the Instagram, every social media, and it's oh, it's just brilliant what's happening. Yeah. And that's uh, that's what I'm saying. The icing on the cake is to get to a major tournament. Yeah, well, fingers crossed that we will get there sooner rather than later. Absolutely, (laughs) absolutely. So, Olivia, I'm going to take a look back on on your career because it's been pretty phenomenal, really, when you think Mm. about it. And also when you think about the challenges that women had when it came to playing sport and the lack of opportunity that there was for such a long time for women, the fact that you were able to have such a a fantastic long career is really a testament to you at your love for the game Mm. and also your dedication to sport. So I'm going to take you on a trip down memory lane and I want to know what your <laughs> earliest memory of sport was. My earliest memory of sport was sitting in my mother sitting around with my father and George Best was on. He was playing for Man United. And it was a Saturday evening and Saturday evening was my dad's day. That was dad's night. That was match of the day. That was his thing. And I used to sit down and watch it with him at the age of six. And I just, I was just memorised by the way he just bounced around players. And, and when I was watching, I was young, but when I was able to realise like what players were, my hero was Brian Robson, Ryan Keane, Ryan Giggs, <clears throat> Ryan Giggs, you know. But the thing that I hadn't got when I was, I hadn't got a female role model, but I had a female role model in a different sport. Like Steffi Graf was my role model, Martina Natalova. These were women that was a conquering Wimbledon, you know what I mean? And I was like, why can't I? I have no role model like that, but they were my role models growing up. And my biggest role model was my dad, because he got it, he got me into the game, you know what I mean? So that's how I started playing. So tell me, like, paint the picture for me. What was it like for you growing up? Like, where where did you live? What were the, were you on the street? Were you in a pitch? Was there other girls playing? What was football for you, like for you when you were young? Well, when I was growing up, obviously, there was no girls teams. So I joined Sheriff, Sheriff Byers at the age of nine. But from six to eight, all I did was play football in the flat. I'm from Sheriff, she came from flats. And I used to play in the flats and the people remember I used to play pats with the ball and I used to just get the ball, kick the ball against the wall and my mum be screaming for me to come in. I didn't want to come in because all I wanted to do was play football. So that's, to me, street football defines a player, especially if they had nothing growing up where there was no women's teams or uh, bias teams. But that's how I ended up playing football with a sheriff under nine's team. So what was the attitude like to you then when you decided you were going to go and join a boys team? Were you welcome? Was it difficult? Did your parents mind? Did the coaches mind? Or did your just talent shine through and they they needed you? Well, you get the well, you get the odd one, what is she doing? The, you know, it's a bias team and blah blah blah. And my manager at the time, Hugo Richardson, he says, if you can be her, then you can show that, you, you know, she shouldn't be here. But I was actually the best player on the team. I run the, from nine to under 14. I was the number, I was the forward. I scored every season 20, 30 goals. So, you know what I mean? They had to let me play. But the thing that happened when I was 14, a team put in a protest about me playing because I was a girl. And... How that changed from a girl's being able to play now, play now today, this day and age from under seven days, is I changed that rule because I still wanted to play because there was no girls' teams that when I was growing up, when I was 14, 15, 16 years of age. My first girls' team was to come to Lady Senior Team. And I joined them when I was 16. And these were all in their 20s and 24s. And it was a bit daunting at the time. But well, I just wanted to play football, so I didn't care who I played with, you know. So, but I did get, what are you doing here? And you shouldn't be playing here. And I got the usual tomboy. And but I didn't care. Just the, the passion for the game just overruled everything. And they must have got some shock then when they actually played against you and saw how good you were. 
oh, and I've had managers off by his team come over and say, oh, my God, I've never seen a girl play like you. And, like, I'm not throwing roses at myself. Now I can get these managers to tell you this. But I've, I've had them come over and shake my hand and apologise because they were given out because I was playing before the game. But after the game, when they see me play, they just come over and shook me hand and just says, you're absolutely brilliant. You must have been playing 24-7, though. Like Absolutely. I eh, slept and drank football. I went to school. Before I went to school, I played it. I came home from school, I played it. I didn't go in for my dinner, I played it. I didn't go in for my tea, I played it. I played it 24-7, end off. The only time I didn't play it properly was when I was asleep. <laughs> and like listening to you and hearing that passion and the love that you had for it I know it was a bit of a, a bit of a different time but at the same time it's hard not to be frustrated as well that those opportunities weren't there for you like that you didn't have the girls team to go and play with that you didn't like that you I, I guess you were treated as being different because you were a girl yeah it was a bit different because like if we went on a bias, when I used to try play with the bias, I had my separate uh, dressing room in Fairview Park, obviously because they were all bias, you know. So little things like that. But seeing it is frustration. It's very frustrating when we were wrong, when we were playing. We had nothing, absolutely nothing. And with the Irish team, we had nothing. All we had was playing for our country, the passion and the honour of playing for your country. That was my motivation playing honoured, being honoured to play for my country. And the thing that I loved most about it was standing there listening to my national anthem. Because to this day, when I go off to Tallinn now, like I go off to Tallinn now tonight and I'll see the girls playing, I get goosebumps when I hear my national anthem. I am very patriotic, but it's in a great way. It's from my country, do you know? So that's what motivated me when I was growing up to play for my country. So when you were growing up then, like you, you wanted to play for a country, but could you see a way of getting there? Like, you know, we talk so much about pathways now and, and you know, there's very clear pathways from when young girls start playing football to how they get onto the national team. Like, did you know how you were going to get there? No, that's, a, I actually didn't have a clue. My manager at the time, um, Simon Bradish, he says to me, he said, I'll leave you just trials going for Ireland and, the AUL uh, um, Santry up there in the complex. And he says, he says, no, I don't know, like, do you want to go? And I, it wasn't really a big thing then, the Irish girls team. So I was like, yeah, I'll go. Like, he says, there's 500, 500 girls going. And that was daunting to me because I didn't even know that 500 girls actually played football when I, at the time. So we went out to San Juan a weekend, 500 girls Friday, 200 girls Saturday, whittled down to 50 girls Sunday, and then Monday you were told whether you were picked on it. And I got the letter, because there was no phones then, I got the letter to say that I was um, picked for the team and the best feeling in the world, best feeling in the world. So when did you realise that you were good at football? Did you know, always know or did it kind of dawn on you at one stage? I'm not bad at this. I knew I had a talent when you're playing football and people are coming over to you and saying, I've never seen a player like you. And, but I, I knew I had a talent, but I, it wasn't a cocky talent. I wasn't cocky about my ability. I knew I was a good player and I knew I could be players and I knew and I needed to be in the right setup to to advance if you know what I mean so when you have managers coming up when I started a drunk drunk country ladies I had the managers of Belvedere ladies Elm Rovers uh, Well Sox ladies all coming over to me at the end of the game saying you should be playing for Ireland you should be playing for Ireland and it just so happened that the trials come up and I ended, ended up playing for Ireland so then I said to myself I, abs I actually should be I actually am good <laughs> because I've 20, it's 23 in the squad and I'm at the coming down from 500 girls so I've some sort of talent you know so and that's what I love about people coming being honest mm -hmm. you know so did you play anything else was it just just football I know I'm only 4 for 11 but me me second love believe it or not was basketball and I loved it did you I, yeah I played in school I remember these two American girls coming over. They were from uh, 
Carolina University teaching us the sport. And she actually asked me, would I go over to America just to, for not for a scholarship or trials, just to experience the basketball part. But I said, so I said, I'm sorry, my passion is football. But that'll tell you. Mm-hmm. I think, Maria, if I put me mind to anything, I'd be great. Yeah. Because I'm not I'm not a good loser. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about everything that I do. And if I put 100% into it, I know I win. You know what I mean? So, and I love table tennis. Love table tennis. So they were my three sports growing up, my three main sports growing up. Where does this uh, the sport come from in your family? Like, is there brothers and sisters that play as well? Like, did your dad or your mom do anything? My dad, my dad we used to play football. He was a hurler as well. But he his main team was football. And... But my brothers and sisters are very good. We're all sporty. Mm-hmm. Every single one of my sisters, well, play probably one, not one of them, Debbie. She's my eldest sister. She's like into Madonna and all. She was into Madonna then. But my youngest sister, Julie, she played for our farm ladies. And my, other, my brothers, they play for all the local teams, Sheriff and, you know, so we have got, there is a sport and dynasty in the O2 family. <laughs> well there definitely is the sport oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so tell me then a bit about right. so you get played, picked to play for Ireland um, mm. you get a letter like how does your career progress from then well when I got the letter I was playing with some ladies at the time and we did a few training camps and then a European campaign started off and Air Force game was Spain and Seville away and it was my debut and I scored a winner in front of 7,000 Spanish supporters and one Irish supporter there with the one Irish flag in the crowd. I'll never forget that moment because when you score for your country, you're euphoria, you're screaming, you're saying, yeah. And then you look around and there's 7,000 Spanish flags and there's one Irish flag and that Irish flag made me so proud. You know, when I scored a goal, so... I was mad when I scored a goal, I actually got a dead leg and I couldn't move after the... But I scored it a late 85th minute, 86th minute, so I stayed on for the last few minutes, you know, so that was my debut. And and from there, like, I just, I wanted to play for Ireland every single day, every weekend. I wanted, I couldn't wait for the train and I couldn't, you know, so... And that was a passion that went on for nearly 20 years of my life. Hmm. It's- pretty phenomenal really when you think about it like no one is ever going to do again what you did playing for their country for for 20 years yeah how how did you keep it up like how did you keep that level of commitment and also that level of form well the the form came in the team I had to move away from my hometown Maria because as you know the strokes and drink and if I hadn't moved away I don't know where I would I'd went but I, I moved away to play football, do you know? So, and I don't mean move away, I just moved out of the environment I was in at the time to, to, to continue what I wanted to do. I wanted to play football and my friends didn't. As you know, you have to define friends if they're encouraging you, brilliant, but if they encourage you to drink every weekend and go to, you need to get away from it if you want to continue what you're doing. So that's what I did. I moved away from him and I concentrated on my football and ended up playing for Ireland for 20 years. But I think the majority of yeah, a thing in football is your passion for the game. Mm-hmm. You have to have passion for the game that you want to play. You know, you just can't be flipping the oh, yeah, I'm playing for Ireland today, wherever. You have to, oh yeah, I'm playing for my country today and embrace it and you know what I mean? The euphoria and the everything, the goosebumps when you get told you're playing. Never, it never ends with me. Never. <laughs> so then, like, we, you know, we, we're seeing Katie McCabe now and she's playing for Arsenal. And as you said, we're seeing social media and, you know, you're seeing the Instagram stories and there's gear mm-hmm. and there's boots. And, um, you know, we're seeing Denise over in America and Diane Caldwell and, and all that. And, like, life looks good. We know it's, like, nothing compared to the men's game. No, no. no. But it, it's a good lifestyle now for, for young yeah. girls who want to go out and, and have a professional career in sport. Yeah. 
what was life like for you? Because you obviously, ha- you know, it's, it, you're, you can't be professional then. Like you can't have the the lifestyle where you can rely on football to, to pay your bills. What was life yeah. like? Well, um, I obviously walked at the time. When I walked, I had, I had to give a shout out to Dublin City Council. They were very good to me. I did, they, they didn't let me take annual leave. They're playing for your country. Go and do what you need to do, which was brilliant at the time because... My teammates at the time had to take annual leaves because they were in different jobs. Different managers and companies had different of your annual leave. And so when I say to me, boss, I need five days off, no problem. You know, so that was good for me. But I seen the other part where the girls, other girls had to take five annual leaves. So they were using the annual leave to play for the country. Do you know, so to me, that's a commitment alone. Mm-hmm. You know, so, but I had never had a problem of going to play for my country where I was, wasn't able to, where I was walking, you know, so I just, I love playing and that was it. Was there a moment where you thought, you know, I've arrived here, I've made it, like I'm a top class athlete, I'm a top class footballer? Yeah, probably when I, t- when I scored my 50th goal. And that was like 19 or 18 years of playing with Ireland. When I scored my 50 goal, 50th goal, and I was like, I'm really, really proud of that moment. Do you know what I mean? So even though I had 54 goals, but the 50th goal was, I'll never forget, I was in UCD, it was against Italy, Italy. You were getting beaten 1 0. I scored, and then they beat us 2 1. And I wasn't too happy after the game because we lost, and I was getting in. Um, presented with the jersey that my 50th gold and all but it was a great moment and a sad moment over the match but a great moment that I scored my 50th gold you know so there's loads of, there's loads of ups and downs like I could be here for four hours talking <laughs> to you you know so yeah well I know from talking to you that you care about winning you know it's like the individual accolades will pale in comparison to what for you is the most important thing is that your Ireland team goes out and wins matches. Mm, mm. So, like that's very, very true or clear. What about setbacks? So like, the, you know, most people I talk to experience setbacks in their career, whether it's not making a team or getting injured or, you know, just something off the pitch happening for you. What so was I've, your setback? I've got really only one setback in me, like believe it or not, I've never been injured. Wow. Never been, never had an ACL, never had nothing and that's where I probably, my career did, uh, and like last 20 years, because I actually did look after my body, you know what I mean? But I didn't do this nutritionism, these protein drinks, because uh, there was nothing there then like that when I, I was playing. So I just looked after my body. I went training and I did the right thing, because you had to then, because you hadn't got what they have today. Like... I'm only had to be listening to any, uh, Katie Taylor there on Sky. Like, what do you do after your game? Protein drink. Mm. What I did after a game is have a cup of tea and come home. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's the difference. You know, so I didn't actually do that just to prolong my career. I just loved the game and I just ended up playing for 20 years. And But the thing that, that like, I would look at Denise O'Sullivan and Diane Cadwell and like Diane, Denise, Diane is around 16, 17 years, you know, so she'd known what it was like when I was playing as well, where the, the sponsors are concerned and the money is concerned, like, we'd nothing. All we wanted to do was just play for our country. Yeah. Like in the end, like, we did get a little bit of money for, I think we ended up in the last two years that I did play for Ireland, I think we got 20 euro for a game, you know, and, and you might think that's... um disgraceful but it was great for us then because that taught you or pay for my taxis out to the airport and back mm-hmm. you know what I mean so there's little things like that that did help but there was an awful lot of things that could have been done yeah better done better where the traveling was concerned where the food wasn't getting you know like little bits like that gear going missing and yeah not being able to swap jerseys with players and little things like that but I mean as I said when you put on the green jersey, you don't care about anything like that. Yeah. Mm. So, like, was there any moment or anything that happened in your career that, you know, you just found it difficult to overcome? 
Well, there's one aspect in me career where I was um, let go from the Irish team and I was heartbroken. That's the only word I can actually describe it as heartbroken. And I'm not going to go into why or whatever, but they had our reasons. And but it was the worst two years of my life because all I was doing playing club football and I was watching the girls going out playing with Ireland. But in the two years after that, when that manager went at the time, the new manager that came in, Noel King, he picked me straight away. Mm -hmm. So to me, I still had what you needed to play for your country. So I didn't understand why I was why I was let go and why, you know, it was never explained to me. It was just said in a meeting, the 22 girls was picked. And if you have a problem with it, come to the manager. I didn't bother going to the manager for, for reasons that I keep to myself. But I'm just saying it was the worst time of year, worst time of my life where football is concerned. And how, like those two years for somebody who's like, obviously should have been playing and could have mm. been playing, like, how did you deal with that mentally? Because it must have been a, a struggle. Well, people have mental problems. I haven't got mental problems. But at the time when that happened to me, I didn't actually know where I was coming or going because I was questioning my ability then. Mm -hmm. And I've never questioned my ability because I know I have ability. But when you're dropped out of a team like that and you're not given a, a reason, or you're not sat down and explained why, you're like... For the two years that I was like, why? Like, why? Tell me why. But I never got an answer. So what I did was I just got on my football. I put my head down. I got back onto this team and eventually I did. Who did you have, who do you think had the biggest impact on your career? There's two people that, three people. There's Sinus sign sign Bradish. He managed me from Rahini to Shamrock Rovers. Dennis Power. You were two managers and my father. They were the three men that defined my football career. <laughs> you want to put it like that. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it, it's, it's great because as well, like something that always comes up when we're talking about women in sports, it's just the importance of having male allies and, and men supporting women along the way as well. When exactly. maybe the, the people that are there now wouldn't have been established and men had to step up to the plate and, and give women a dig out and coach teams and be there for them. Mm -hmm. And plenty of them did as well. Um, when you look back on, on your career and you think of when you were playing around the flats and all you wanted to do was be a footballer and you think of the performance, like if any perfect performance, a performance that defines you, one that you would have dreamed of, is there one that sticks out in your head? There's a game that we played in Richmond Park against uh, Croatia and it was a European qualifier and they were winning us 1-0 and I scored a hat-trick. I ended up scoring a hat-trick. And there was one goal in that match. And as you know, there was no video analyst or nothing then. And it's not on video, but I took it down on the chest in the, at the edge of the box and hit over a volley. And everybody, even like if I meet a man, if I meet somebody that was at that game 20 years later, they remember. Do you know, so I'm like, you actually remember that goal? He says, why, how could I not forget that goal? You know, because it was phenomenal, like, Mm -hmm. The only, as I said, it was nobody will ever know or see them because there was no recordings. But that was one of me, one of me best games and one of me highlights of playing with Ireland, even though we were beaten four 0 was in America playing um, in front of twenty two thousand people. And they're going from three hundred people watching you in Richmond Park, yeah. say in August, and then in September you're going to America in the UCE ball or something and 20,000 people. I was overawed. I was, I was like gobsmacked. I was like, Where the, where's all these people that they're coming from? Because I didn't know women's football was so popular in America then, you know? So they are two of the things that define my football when I think back. Yeah. You no. Know? And what about successes then for you when you look back on your career and your life so far, what for you has been your greatest success? My greatest success where football is concerned is probably I've won the FAI um, Senior Player Award three times. I have a, um, I was put into the Hall of Fame. I was put in, but these are all just little things. The big thing that I did in my life after probably leaving the Irish setup 
Now, I know you're talking about Jorana was carrying the Olympic torch. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't, and I, and I got that. I was asked to do that because of my accolade with the Irish team. So to me, that saying, well, obviously you did something right and for people to ask you to carry this torch on what you had to do. Do you know what I mean? So they were the things that defined me after I played and while I was playing. But while I was playing, the accolade was, I just wanted to play and I knew I, I was top scorer every year. And I, you know, I don't think in my lifetime that anyone is ever going to score 54 goals again for Ireland ladies team. Where, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Where that is going to be a record that probably will never be broke. But somebody winning the FAI award three times, that probably be broke. You know, so that's one of my little accolades that I love that I think nobody will ever break. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I would love somebody, if somebody broke it and got us to a World Cup qualifier, absolutely, yes. You know what I mean? But these are the things that define football, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think then will be your legacy? Oh, God. Um, the hard one. Yeah, I don't know, really. Like, the legacy, like, look, is listening to girls saying that they watched me growing up and they wanted to be like me when they were growing up. That's probably the legacy that I'm at the leave, mm -hmm. which I actually didn't really realise that I had an impact on so many girls in the game at the moment. Like, for instance, last week I went to Shelbourne and Wexford, the last league game. And I was talking to a few girls and you were like, Livy, you've no idea what you did for me. And I had probably just said to, to this girl before a game, good luck and just go out and do your best. You know, so little things like that is great to hear. And it's great to hear that I'm out of the game 14 years, 14 years, but I'm still getting spoken by in good, in good fit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what's next for you then, Olivia? Like, what, what, what's the plan? What's like? Do you have anything that you, that you'd like to do? Well, at the moment now, I'm um, managing Usher Celtic Ladies Football Team, and um, we only started. We only started up there in March, and as you know, the COVID and all, and but we came toward in our league, which I thought was absolutely brilliant for our Air Force season. Do you know what I mean? So. And this is what I want to do. I want to build a team. I want to get a team into the National League. And I want to be able to say to them, there you go, you're 16, go and play for Ireland. I'll go and play for Ireland. And I'd love that you didn't have to leave Ireland to play in England. I'd love even semi-professional in Ireland to keep them here. Because the grassroots, that's where it comes from. Do you know what I mean? It has to be built. And that's what I want to do. Like I have 16... A 16 and a 15 year old, and this 16 year old is phenomenal. But as you know, she's smelling herself. She wants to go out with her friends. But I'm putting my arm around that and telling her how much she can achieve in her life at this very moment, I'm telling her. And she's listening to me. And we only came back there the weekend. We went down to Tipperary for a little exhibition game. You know, for there's two girls off the team who's from Tipperary. So we went down and played our ex team, and it was like a team bonding. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what I want to do. I have Usher Celtic ladies and if anybody in any way, shape or form, can't play, can't play, wants to play, get in touch. I'll take you on. I'll teach you. I'll do anything. Well, Olivia, thank you so much for joining me, but also for the career and the just the fact that you've been able to inspire so many girls into the game like that is just phenomenal and especially when it wasn't easy now it's different and there's opportunities for girls and for women to go and play sport when you were playing it wasn't there you made it all happen yourself yeah. you, went out, you went after it you stuck with it you never gave up and you just the love of your game the, the love you have for the game just shines through and it's it's brilliant so I just want to thank you for all the years everything you did for Ireland everything you did for all the girls and women as well who mm -hmm. loved football growing up and loved you and um, thanks for giving me the time too and for everyone who just tuned in as well um, thanks for watching and listening please subscribe and leave a review <laughs>